I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name, amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life, amen. amen. Lord, open our lips. And our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. Let us join now in reciting the Venite. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. 
In his hand are the caverns of the earth, and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. Our first reading is from the book of Genesis. The child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, playing with her son Isaac. So she said to Abraham, Cast out this slave woman with her son. For the son of this slave woman shall not inherit along with my son Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, Do not be distressed because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. For it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named for you. As for the son of the slave woman, I will make a nation of him also, because he is your offspring. So Abraham rose early in the morning, and took bread and a skin of water, and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder, along with the child, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she cast the child under one of the bushes, 
Then she went away and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot. For she said, Do not let me look upon the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make a great nation of him. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy, and he grew up. He lived in the wilderness and became an expert with the bow. He lived in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother got a wife from him, for him from the land of Egypt. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from Paul's letter to the Romans. Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. D the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God.
A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus said to the twelve apostles, A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher, and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, will acknowledge me, who acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the world. I am not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against his mother, her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I speak to you in the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. Two days ago, many Americans celebrated a special holiday called Juneteenth. Yet this is a holiday that many others in our country aren't even aware of or have heard of only recently. While it has been celebrated since 1866, I myself first heard of it only a few years ago. Juneteenth is a commemoration of the 19th of June in 1865 the day that a Union Army general showed up in Texas and told the last group of enslaved Americans that they had been set free nearly two and a half years earlier in the Emancipation Proclamation. Two days after this celebration, we find ourselves here in church listening to an account in Holy Scripture of a slave owned by our forefather Abraham. There are two halves to this story. It begins in chapter 16 of Genesis and then jumps to chapter 21, where we are today. In the first half, we are in the middle of the story of the patriarch and matriarch of all Israel, Abraham and Sarah. In the context, It is clear from recent events that they are at the head of a powerful nomadic organization, one powerful enough to destroy an alliance of kings and wealthy enough to return all plunder to its rightful owners. In the region surrounding Hebron, in the hills between the Mediterranean and the Dead Sea, north of Egypt and south of Assyria, Abraham's clan was at the top of the pecking order. Yet not all is well. Sarah has been unable to bear a child, a rightful heir to the inheritance and the first step toward the establishment of a dynasty. The continuance of a bloodline in this culture 
is of such importance for both political and religious reasons that there are multiple acceptable routes around this problem. The one taken is deliberate, not the only choice. If Abraham were to take another wife to bear a child from one of the kings of the land, Sarah would lose the inherited power and status that she has being attached to Abraham. As a woman in this patriarchal setting, she has little value apart from her role and connection to this man. And so she takes control of the situation, putting events in motion to retain her place, even if it comes at the expense of another woman's personhood. And so enters a new figure into the story, a woman named Hagar. Although technically that's not quite accurate. While our English Bibles capitalize Hagar and use it as a proper name in a way that seems quite conventional, the Hebrew used here is Hagar. The Ha is the definite article, the. And Gar is a masculine noun that means foreigner, alien, sojourner. The epithet reduces this woman to an object rather than a person. She is the foreign object, reminiscent of how some in our country today label certain people as an illegal. We don't know how she came to be with Sarah, but the text tells us that she is Egyptian and Sarah initially refers to her as her maidservant. Yet the way that she is treated throughout these stories makes the revised title in chapter 21 more accurate. Here at the beginning, Sarah approaches Abraham and offers her her foreigner as a surrogate mother for an heir. The Gar has no choice in the matter. She is a sex slave with no status or even a proper name, a tool to be used, which can then be thrown aside when no longer valuable. And thus, Abraham gains a concubine and Sarah a son, because the Gar cannot even retain rights connected to her own offspring. All of the Gar receives are beatings from the jealous Sarah. Five chapters later, we come to a second turning point. In the intervening story, the Gar's child, Ishmael, has grown into his early teenage years. God's promise to Abraham has been renewed, and Sarah has miraculously given birth to her own son, Isaac. One day, Sarah sees Ishmael laughing at his young brother, Isaac, and she is outraged. Although Ishmael is officially her son by surrogate, since the Gar has no rights, Sarah's natural son Isaac is her stronger connection to dynastic power, and she wants no equals involved. Sarah storms into Abraham's tent and demands, drive that slave out, her and her son, for neither shall share inheritance with me and mine. Abraham is reluctant, but he does not resist. The gar is sent out into a desert, bearing only Ishmael and a day's provisions. Her years of faithful service, her lack of any personhood or life agency, none of it matters when it is more convenient to the powerful that she and her child be discarded. In spite of Sarah's pitiless abuse, an effective sentence of death, God intervenes on the very brink and provides a dynasty of her own to the Gar, whose ancestry leads to Muhammad and the great nations of Islam. And the Hebrew epithet Gar is transformed into the Arabic proper name Hajar, meaning splendid, nourishing, favored for women across Arabia and Africa for millennia. Yet none of this absolves the guilt of Abraham and Sarah for taking the price of an easy peace out of the flesh of another human. 
So what might we learn from this story today? Well, for one, it reminds us of the numerous texts in the Bible that were used so effectively by Christian denominations, theologians, and ministers, including Episcopal priests in our own diocese, to establish and defend chattel slavery in this country for centuries. Because of stories like this, the abolitionists were left to argue on vaguely liberal grounds of the spirit of the text, while the establishment pointed at the clear conservative textual basis for their doctrines of dehumanization. This is something that the white Christians of today, like myself, must still fully repent of, as has never been fully accomplished not only by ceasing the injustices which still continue in more subtle ways, but also by making things right in relinquishing the unequal power and wealth we have inherited on the backs of people of color. For another, this story might encourage Christian people of color to see how God is on their side, even when the systems of power are against them. This is why some African-American Christians refer to themselves as Hagar's children, recognizing their heritage of African ancestry and oppression alike contained in her body. And finally, I believe we can turn to Jesus' words in Matthew to see what our next steps as both black and white Christians may look like in ways that directly reflect both the past decades and centuries of American history, as well as the moment we find ourselves in now. In the 10th chapter of Matthew, Jesus is giving instructions to his disciples on how to be on mission, to be his people. They are to proclaim the message that the kingdom of God has come and provide healing for the people and they are to be marked as itinerant, impoverished, defenseless workers, reliant solely on the hospitality of those they serve. And what might these followers, these Christians, expect to gain from this work? In a word, suffering. In terms which likely reflect the experience of the early church as well as Jesus' first disciples, they will face enmity, rejection, and death. Not as an accident, but as a direct result of the message they are bringing. Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's foes will be members of one's own household. To bring a sword is not literally about a weapon of war. This, after all, is the gospeler, who later records Jesus as saying, those who live by the sword die by the sword, in rebuking a disciple who attempts to use a weapon for defense. As Luke's version more clearly puts it, this is about division. Because the peace of God that Jesus brings is not the kind of peace which comes at the expense of the oppressed on behalf of the powerful. Abraham chose peace in his family by upholding a hierarchy of oppression, sacrificing the gar, and son on the altar of propriety and order. Jesus' peace shows how inherently broken that is and would bring forth the division that already exists. Early 19th century white America chose peace by allowing half the country to continue treating black people as subhuman. Jesus' peace in the hands of the abolitionists did not cause division. It revealed the division already there. 
early 20th century white America chose peace by segregation and systematic oppression so that the actual division would be suppressed under the surface. Jesus' peace in the hands of people like Minister Martin Luther King Jr., writer James Baldwin, and politician John Lewis brought those real divisions back to light so that they could be worked on. Today, once again, just as in the 1860s and 1960s, that false peace is being shown for the lie that it has always been. Once again, Jesus' peace calls us to pursue a course that must begin in the division of society as usual, because society as usual has been deliberately constructed as unjust in favor of those who will do anything to keep it that way. Peace through oppression is too high a price. Peace through police brutality is not true peace. Peace that condemns those who protest injustice more than it condemns the oppressors is not Jesus' peace. So today, let us remember that Jesus calls us to a way that will divide our families, alienate our neighbors, and be condemned by the establishment because so many don't want to face the reality of injustice around us. Let us resolve to pursue this course, even knowing the rejection and suffering we might face, because it is the very mission and kingdom of God. Amen. Let us join together in reciting the, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord. And grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Let your people sing with joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world. For only in you can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under your care. And guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon earth. Your saving health among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten. Nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God, and sustain us with your Holy Spirit. O Lord, make us have perpetual love and reverence for your holy name, for you never fail to help and govern those whom you have set upon the sure foundation of your loving kindness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Lord God, almighty and everlasting Father, you have brought us in safety to this new day. 
Preserve us with your mighty power, that we may not fall into sin, nor be overcome by adversity. And in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. We have been united with Christ in his death and made one with him in his resurrection. In this newness of life, we raise our hearts in joyful prayer, responding, Kyrie eleison. That the church and her peoples may name the crosses that impede their work and ministry, so that they may focus once again upon the sovereignty of Christ, who is the source of all our blessings. Let us pray, Kyrie eleison that we may be softened by the remembrance of personal darkness and despair and give generously to the relief of the hungry and fearful, the sick, and those who work multiple jobs and still struggle to provide for the basic necessities of life. Let us pray, Kyrie eleison, for all who hold positions of public trust and responsibility, that they may serve the common good with integrity and sound moral judgment. Let us pray, Kyrie eleison, for those who are being cast out of their native land through political chaos, religious persecution, war and famine, natural disasters, and reasons that remain unknown, that they may find receptive countries as they search for a new homeland. Let us pray, Kyrie eleison, for those who have died, that they may join the community of saints in whose fellowship we will one day reside. Let us pray, Kyrie eleison, that the gift of Christ's body and blood may sustain and strengthen us as we share the faith of the saints who have come before. Let us pray. Kyrie eleison. Let us endure faithfully in the practice of intercession as we continue our petitions. We pray for Catherine, Tom, Linda, Colleen, Marion, Shirley, Marty, Mason, Jay, Jerry, Lauren, Irene, Kevin, Raylan, Shayla, Mike, Alicia, Lee, Amina, Ray, Aaron, Chris, Donna, Joyce, Sydney, Elsa, Joe, Julius, and Ann. And for all who have died in communion of your church and those whose faith is known to you alone, that with all the saints they may have rest in that place where there is no pain or grief, but life eternal. Let us pray, Kyrie eleison. We also pray for Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, Mike, our bishop, John, our priest, and Al, our deacon. And on the diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for Pedrick and summer camps and in our companion diocese in Colombia. We pray for the Reverend Roberto Anibal Burituego Mission Santo Tomas. I invite you at this time to add your own petitions and intercessions. Lord, we pray for all in this country who struggle with sickness, with isolation, with oppression, with the struggles of life. Give us all strength to come together as a community to protect those who are vulnerable among us, to stand with those whose voices must be heard Help us be your hands and feet in this world. Almighty and ever-living God, 
ruler of all things in heaven and earth, hear our prayers for this parish family. Strengthen the faithful, arouse the careless, and restore the penitent. Grant us all things necessary for our common life, and bring us all to be of one heart and mind within your holy church, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us join now in the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come life everlasting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's time now to honor the birthdays and anniversaries of those in our church in this coming week. We now recognize the birthdays of Zane and Rebecca. Please join in reciting the birthday prayer. Gracious God, as we rejoice in the birthday of these your children, we pray that the year ahead will be one of blessing and peace, and that the year will bring continual joy in the knowledge of your steadfast grace and love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And for anniversaries, we recognize Lucas and Anne, our deacon Al and Cheryl, and Tom and Gwyn. 
let us recite this birthday prayer together. Loving God, you have blessed these couples with the gift of marriage. We pray that they may continue to love, honor, and cherish each other, and that they will find in each other the reflection of your abiding and sustaining grace through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now for announcements. We do have some changes coming up. Uh, this next two Sundays after today, I will be um, taking a little bit of time off and we will be, as a parish, encouraging you all to take advantage of the diocesan uh, Holy Eucharist or the Holy Eucharist offered from the National Cathedral as we take this break. We will continue having coffee hour and we will be doing this at 10 a.m. for these weeks so that those who wish to um, do coffee hour and then the National Cathedral at 11 can do so. For those doing the diocesan Eucharist, it starts at 9.30 and you can come just a little bit late. That will give everyone an option to, to join in on the coffee hour. And again, we also have the diocesan family night prayer continuing. For these two weeks, we will not be doing the Tuesday, Thursday evening prayers. Those will restart again after I return. After I return, we will also try to adjust the timing so we can continue having coffee hour with those who enjoy the National Cathedral service. So stay tuned to adjusted timing for that. We'll be out in our post and our other announcements. Thank you all for sending in your thoughts on the survey. Uh, we are taking this into consideration as we continue to look toward how we can safely remain church in this time. And now, may the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay.